Good evening, everybody. My name is Mara Bernstein. I'm the program director here at Park Avenue Synagogue. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here in person and online to tonight's Reading Jewish Lives program. A special thank you to our partners at Milton School of Adult Jewish Learning and Jewish Lives. We are so grateful for your support and partnership. A little bit about Jewish Lives. Jewish Lives is a prize-winning series of biographies designed to explore many facets of Jewish identity. Subjects are thoughtfully paired with authors to create lively, deeply informed books. 68 biographies have been published to date, including Spinoza, Henrietta Zold, Alfred Dreyfus, Golda Meir, and many more. Jewish Lives is a partnership of Yale University Press and the Leon D. Black Foundation. You can learn more about their books at jewishlives.org. We are gearing up for Passover, so there's no better time to talk about the legendary biblical prophet Elijah. Our guest tonight is doc scholar Dr. Daniel Matt, author of the Jewish Lives biography, Becoming Elijah, Prophet of Transformation. Daniel Matt's biography is available at a special discount of 30% off at jewishlives.org. Just use code Elijah at checkout. And for those of you who are here in person, we are selling the book and we will have a book signing after the program. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Our moderator this evening is Rabbi Elliot Cosgrove, senior rabbi at Park Avenue Synagogue. For those of you who don't know, Rabbi Cosgrove also serves the Jewish community beyond PAS, including as a member of the Chancellor's Cabinet of JTS, the Executive Committee of the Rabbinical Assembly, the New York Board of Rabbis, and the Board of UJ Federation of New York. Our guest this evening, Dr. Daniel Matt, is a leading authority on Kabbalah, Jewish mystical text. He is the author of over a dozen books, including The Essential Kabbalah, Zohar, Annotated and Explained, and God and the Big Bang, Discovering Harmony Between Science and Spirituality. His nine volume annotated translation, the Zohar Pritzker edition, was honored with a National Jewish Book Award and has been hailed as a monumental contribution to the history of Jewish thought. Thank you both so much for being here tonight and doing this program. We very much look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Mara. Let's uh, thank Mara and the entire adult programming team. Thank you. Nothing happens here without you, and we are grateful to you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to uh, Professor Matt, Daniel, Dr. Matt. Uh, we're honored to have you here. You are a personal hero of mine, and uh, your scholarly work over uh, the years has inspired and will continue to inspire generations. So to sit here and be in dialogue with you is, is really just an honor. And congratulations. This book has been out for a while, but as Mara said, it's right before Passover. And so there are some people who are here because, like me, they're fans of you. There are some people who are here because they've read the book. And there are some people who are here who are just interested, hoping to get a little something to say at their Passover seders uh, about Elijah. So. For whatever reason you're here, we welcome you. Uh, maybe we'll just begin. Uh, this is part of the Jewish Lives series. And maybe you could tell us how this book came about. Has anyone ever studied Elijah the prophet in, in this sort of way as you have? How did this book come to be? Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. And good we can have this conversation, Elliot, about this unique figure. I think he's the most fascinating figure in the, in the Bible maybe in all of Jewish life, because it's so hard to pin him down. And I think the reason I wrote the book, I was invited by, uh, by Steve Zipperstein at Jewish Lives to contribute a volume, and he suggested someone else. He actually suggested Joseph Caro. I tried that for a few months, and I decided I don't want to live with this man, Caro, for several years. And I came up with the idea of Elijah. I, I had to sell Steve and Jewish Lives on it a little, but I finally convinced them Elijah is really the only person who fits Jewish lives because Jewish lives is in the plural. And Elijah is the only one who's had several. And it's really that, that that's what intrigued me especially because the Elijah we find in the Bible is so different than this Eliyahu Hanavi, this figure we're going to invite into our homes uh, in just uh, about a week and a half. And that's what, what I found so strange. How does this fierce zealot, this fierce biblical zealot who's out to defeat the prophets of Baal, how does he turn into this compassionate 
Jewish superhero. That's who Elijah is. He's really the Jewish superhero. And he's so different than we find in the Bible. So that's, that's what intrigued me. And also, you know, I think this may be true for many of you. When you hear a, about Elijah, if you're in a discussion about Elijah, it's very often in a humorous context. You know, it's almost people, people make jokes about Elijah more than they really explore who he was. Because what is claimed about him is so overwhelming, it's hard to really accept it, and people just you know, find a way to, to avoid confronting him, I think. So I wanted to, um, to explore that, how he changes from the fierce zealot to the compassionate, loving figure of folk, folklore and, and the person and we invite to the Seder. And what I eventually discovered was that really what happens with Eliyahu is a tikkun. He really undergoes a tikkun. What, to right? find tikkuns for those tikkun who don't is, know? Tikkun is hard to define, but I would say a, a mending, a repair. He, he, really, he rehabilitates himself. He works on his own violence. You could say that the rabbis do this to him, right? Because already in the Talmud and the Midrash, He's very different than we find in the Bible, in the Book of Kings. So the rabbis themselves seem somewhat uncomfortable with the harshness of the biblical Elijah. So you could say they bring about a transformation. They perform this tikkun, this mending. But then I came to think it's not the rabbis who do it, it's really Eliyahu himself. Eliyahu comes back in order to work on himself. Right, because according to the book of Kings, Elijah is taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. Right, the end of his life, the book of Kings says, uh, he went up to heaven. And what does that mean? It's not clear if, if that means he, he died a spectacular death, or does it mean he escaped death entirely? And really, it's left open in the Bible. You really could conclude either way. He died, but he died in an amazing way, or he never died. It's interesting, Elisha, his disciple, Elisha thinks that he's died. Because what does Elisha do? He tears his clothes, right? That act of kriah. Tearing the clothes is what you do when a relative, when someone close to you dies. And Elisha tears his clothes because he thinks Elijah has died. But the rabbis conclude that he never tasted the taste of death. So, so let's start in the Bible and then we'll move through Jewish mysticism and his present at uh, seders and brisses and other finely catered occasions. So <clears throat> let's start with the Bible because uh, Elijah, the prophet, he speaks truth to power. He also performs miracles. He's also a terribly violent figure. There's this right. gruesome scene of him slaying the, the prophets of Baal. Right. I remember going on a hike in Mount Carmel, and there's this statue. I don't know if anyone's ever been there, but it's just a, a statue of Elijah, or what we think Elijah must have looked like, with a bunch of severed heads around. I mean, it's real gruesome stuff. So who, biblically speaking, we're going to get to mysticism mm -hmm. and uh, the reception history of Elijah, but biblically speaking, um, how do we make sense of all these different personas of Elijah? Compassion, healing, hmm. truth to power, violence. Right. I mean, he's, you know, the first we hear about him, he just pops up out of nowhere and he's confronting King Ahab, right, the king of Israel. We don't know anything about his family. Like, there's Nothing, no childhood like, stories. Right. Little League score, anything like that. Nothing. nothing about his birth, nothing about his parents. We don't know anything about his personal life. We don't know if he married. We don't know if he had children. Christians revere him as the one who began a monastic tradition. And you could claim that because we don't hear anything about sexuality, about relations, about a wife or children. But he confronts the king and he says, the first thing we hear is there's going to be a drought. He declares a drought. He doesn't even say why. But it's pretty clear it's because Ahab and Jezebel, right? Everything is always blamed on the woman. So it's the wicked Jezebel. She had introduced the worship of Baal and Asherah. The Israelites were already attracted to the Canaanite gods and goddesses. But Jezebel imports extra, extra priests and a whole ritual. And it's because of the worship of false gods that Elijah declares there'll be a drought. 
So he's confronting the king. He's always confronting. Everything about him is confrontation. But he's also characterized by miracles. He's, there are more miracles about uh, Elijah and his disciple Elisha than about anyone else in the Bible. He's really characterized by miracles, miracles performed for him and miracles that he performs. And that great contest on Mount Carmel where he, he defeats the prophets of Baal and all of the Israelites bow down and what do they say? Hashem hu ha Elohim. Hashem hu ha Elohim. That, of course, became part of our ritual, one of the holiest moments of the year, the conclusion of Yom Kippur, where we chant not two times, but seven times, Hashem hu ha Elohim. So that line, concluding Yom Kippur, comes right from the Elijah story. So that's his great moment of triumph. He's bringing the Israelites back to monotheism. That's what he's doing. He's fighting for the one true God, but Jezebel is then out to get him. He flees. He's always on, on the road, always on the run. He's carried by the Ruach. He's really characterized by the Ruach, by the wind, by the spirit. One of Ahab's uh, officers says to him, I, may not, I better not let go of you because Ruach Adonai Yisa'acha, the spirit of God will carry you off al asher lo eda, to I know not where. You never know where Elijah is going to pop up. Right? And then in all later stories, all later folklore, he disappears. He appears and performs his miracle. He disappears, somewhat like the Lone Ranger, although that, that dates me very much. But he, it, he, you just can't, you can't get a hold of him already in the Bible. But he's, not, he's a fierce figure. So after he defeats the prophets of Baal, what does he do? He doesn't convert them to monotheism. As you said, he slaughters them. He slaughters 450 prophets of Baal. And that, that violent streak really you know, doesn't leave him. He can be compassionate. He's compassionate also in the Bible. He brings a little boy back to life. It's the first time we ever hear in the Bible anything about revival of the dead is with Elijah. So there's something about conquering death that characterizes him. Maybe he never died. That's what the rabbis conclude. He brings a child back to life. He will announce the Mashiach and be part of the revival of the dead. Now, what, why does he... Does it, does, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Does his name mean anything? Oftentimes in the Bible, names have significance. Yeah. What, what does Eliyahu mean? Yeah, you know, so many biblical names have a divine element in them, right? Shemuel, Yirmiyahu. So many of the heroes of the Bible have El or Yudhe, Yudhevav, but Eliyahu has two. Eliyahu. My God is Yahoo. Okay, it doesn't mean that he was obsessed with social media. <laughs> it's that he, my God is Yudhevavhe. So he, he's suffused by God. He's permeated by God. Maybe he's somewhat obsessed by God, as, as a prophet perhaps has to be. Uh, sometimes you don't know if maybe he gets carried away a little bit with himself. You know, it's hard for the prophet to distinguish his own self from this divine ruach that's blowing through him. So he says to Ahab, there'll be no rain until I say so. Now, is he, is he conveying the word of God or is he claiming that power himself? So he's filled with the divine, he's filled with the divine spirit. And we should probably also include, I know there's so much to cover in our, our brief talk tonight, brief conversation, but we should mention this, the prophet Malachi, right after the book of Kings, all the Elijah story is in these chapters in the book of Kings. But then later you find in the very last book of all the prophets, Malachi, there, how does Malachi end? The end of the book of Malachi, which we'll chant as the Haftarah on Shabbat HaGadol coming up. He says, Hine Anochi Sholeach Lachem et Eliyah Hanavi. Here he's called Eliyah instead of Eliyahu, but obviously the same person. I'm sending to you Elijah the prophet, Malachi says. When? Lifne bo yom Hashem Hagadol Vahanora, before the day of Yudhevave, before the day of the Lord. So already in the Bible there's a prediction that Elijah is going to announce the coming of the final day. Right? The Bible doesn't call it the Mashiach, but that's what the rabbis see as the Mashiach. That's why Elijah is seen as the harbinger of the Messiah, the one who will announce the Messiah, because of that prediction already in the Bible itself. So already in the Bible, there's some sense that he did not die. So from that final mention, perhaps 
based on the fact that we don't know if he died or was ascended into heaven, right. uh, then he takes on this um, new identity in rabbinic literature. Right, that Elijah is, you know, could be the harbinger of the Messiah, right. but also, you know, this this sort of figure, well, where's Waldo sort of figure who appears and mm -hmm. reappears and is a bearer of wisdom, or perhaps, you know, telling us where the Messiah will be found at the gates of the city with uh, bandaging the mm -hmm. lepers. Some of the, some of the great rabbinic stories uh, have. Elijah walking in, right. uh, as it were. And so, so ha that whole literature of Elijah's stories, mm. um, that, where, where does that, that, that comes from? Or, or that's just, he becomes a, a folk hero, as it were. I think, I think because the belief was he's up in heaven, he, he's available, right? It's not, you know, there's one other biblical figure who goes up to heaven. Who is that? Enoch. Right, Enoch, near the, near the very beginning of Genesis, it says, Ve'enenu, he was no longer ki lakachoto Elohim, because God took him. Does that mean he died or God took him up to heaven? Well, it was understood to mean God took him up to heaven, but Enoch never comes back. Elijah isn't stuck in heaven. He's residing in heaven. He attends the heavenly yeshiva, right? That's what you do when you die. If you've been righteous, you get, to, you get to admitted into the heavenly academy. So Elijah is there in the Heavenly Academy, but he comes down, he swoops down to earth when, when there's need. He can, he can save people. He can discuss Torah with rabbis. But what's amazing is you don't know he's Elijah necessarily. Why? Because he's a shapeshifter. He doesn't appear as, usually, often he appears as an old man, but he can appear as a slave, as a Roman, uh, as a Persian, as a, as a dignitary. There's one amazing story in the Talmud where he, he appears in a very unusual form. Rabbi Meir, a great hero of, of the Mishnah, Rabbi Meir rescued his sister-in-law who was condemned to serve in a Roman brothel. Rabbi Meir's sister-in-law was condemned to a Roman brothel and Rabbi Meir rescued her. So the Romans were out to get Rabbi Meir. They posted his picture on the gates of Rome they said, anybody who finds him, bring him. So Roman soldiers were out, and they spotted Rabbi Meir. They were about to grab him. Who shows up in the nick of time? Eliyahu Hanavi. In what form? As a prostitute. She embraces Rabbi Meir. The soldiers say, ah, oh, that couldn't be Rabbi Meir. And he escapes. So Eliyahu kind of breaks the rules. He does the unexpected. He's really the master of, of surprise. And he can, he can take on any form. He can appear in any guise. So he is, he is, the, he is the greatest example of the, of the Jewish folk hero. And I think it's because it's not clear whether he died. And now you've devoted your life to the study of Jewish mysticism. So we're just going to keep moving forward in uh, the chronology. And, and uh, Louis Ginsburg, uh, of blessed memory, said, what Moses was to the Torah, Elijah was to the Kabbalah. And yeah. I was wondering if you could unpack that and, yeah. and, and the role Eliyahu plays in huh. Jewish mysticism. Yeah, it's a very strange statement. I think it's somewhat of an exaggeration, right? What Moses was to the Torah, who could be more basic to the Torah than Moses? Elijah played that role in Kabbalah. But there's something to it, and the reason is that, remember I spoke about the Ruach, the spirit. So Elijah masters the Ruach eventually in his post-biblical career, and really he becomes, he's able to navigate the Ruach, not just to be carried by it, but to convey it to others. And I'm thinking here specifically about a particular kind of Ruach, Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Elijah becomes the one who, who conveys inspiration. So if a medieval spiritual seeker, actually Jewish or Christian or Islamic, all three traditions see Elijah as inspiring the mystics. But especially so in, in Jewish teaching, the goal is to have what's called Gilui Eliyahu, a revelation of Elijah. Now, already in the Talmud, you have accounts of rabbis encountering Elijah, but it's in Kabbalah that that term emerges, 
Gilui Eliyahu, a revelation of Elijah, and many of the early Kabbalists were credited with having a vision of Elijah. Why? I think because they came up with some radically new ideas about God and about reality. For example, that God is half male and half female. That's a pretty radical notion. Or that God needs us. God is incomplete without our active participation. How could you come up with such a radical idea? How could you claim that, that you discovered it? The Kabbalists said this was revealed by Eliyahu. Now, does that mean that they actually met Eliyahu out there and he gave them an idea? Or is it talking about some inner experience which was, which was experienced as an encounter with, with some unknown presence? So I think Eliyahu becomes identified with inspiration itself. He's the embodiment of Ruach HaKodesh. And that's why he was so central to, to spiritual seekers, to Kabbalists and Hasidim, to Sufis in Islam, to some of the great Christian saints, Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross. They devoted their lives. They were actually Carmelites, right? A whole monastic order in Christianity were called Carmelites because they believed that Elijah on Mount Carmel, that's where he had his contest with the prophets of Baal, that Elijah actually established a school of mysticism on Mount Carmel. So it's amazing. In a sense, I would say he's the, he's the figure who's most equally shared among all three monotheistic faiths. Right. There, there was a fascinating fun fact towards the end of the book that uh, Swing Low Sweet Chariot mm. is actually based on Elijah. On the chariot. On the chariot of Elijah. Right. And that, that's an uh, African-American spiritual. spiritual. So it's kind of as if that, that slave who composed the song, he wanted to experience what Elijah experienced. If the chariot came for Elijah, the chariot can come for me too. Even if I'm not you know, freed physically here, I can be redeemed ultimately. So that really brings me to why I called the book Becoming Elijah. Through 98% of the book, Becoming Elijah means what we've talked about so far, how this fierce zealot turned into a compassionate folk hero. How did that transformation come about? How did he become Eliyahu Hanavi? But then in the last few pages, it takes on a different meaning, Becoming Elijah, because of what's taught in Hasidism. Hasidism speaks about Bechinat Eliyahu. Now, the Hebrew word Bechina, some of you may know it as exam or test, but it also means an aspect, a quality. So Hasidism teaches that each of us has a, a spark of Elijah. Each of us has an aspect of Elijah that's waiting to be developed. What is that? It's a passion for truth. It's a desire to uplift other people. It's a yearning for God. It's the possibility of inspiration. That's an Elijah element. And we have to take that spark and fan it into a flame and in that sense become Elijah. So I really wanted the book to bridge both of those, how Elijah became who he became and how each of us could, uh, could develop that, that spiritual potential. So I want to ask 8,000 more questions. <laughs> the, I wrote my dissertation on... Uh, 20th century theologian named Louis Jacobs. And Louis Jacobs wrote an entire book mm. whose title is Teiku, T-E-Y-K-U, which in Hebrew is um, Tishbi Yataret Kushiot Uvayot, which is to say that the Tishbite will resolve uh, all of the, the insoluble mm. debates of the rabbis. Uh, so when there's a uh, you know, the rabbinic literature is a compendium of debates, this rabbi arguing with that rabbi. Nine times out of ten, one rabbi's opinion holds sway. But I think maybe a couple hundred times in Talmudic literature, it says um, teku, which if you go to a Hebrew and Israeli soccer game now, football match, a tie is a teku. So how did... Um, Elijah become this, you know, prophet of dispute resolution, <clears throat> that he will, um, he's the guy who's going to answer all of the, the kashyas, all of the tough questions. Right. 
Yeah, that term teku is so interesting, and it's beautiful that in, in Israel today it means a tie. So in the Talmud it means kind of this is a tie. We don't know who won the debate. We're going to let it stand. Now literally, literally teku means let it stand. Not like the Hebrew word kum. Teku is related to the same root. It means let it stand. And it's not really talking about Elijah. Originally it's saying let it stand. Eventually maybe this will be resolved. For now let it stand. But in medieval times it was understood as an acronym tishbi yitaretz kushyotu vayot. The tishbite will, will answer any any unresolved disputes. So why does Elijah take on that role? Really because the rabbis say, what is he going to do when the Mashiach comes? He's going to announce the Messiah, but then he's going to clarify any doubts. He won't actually make halachic decisions himself, but he'll provide us with the information which we didn't have, which will enable us to determine what the correct answer is. He'll, he'll reconcile all disputes. He'll bring peace between contending parties. So this also is so different, right? In the Bible, he's not trying to bring peace. He's trying to wipe out the, the worshipers of Baal and Asherah. He's trying to exterminate the idolaters. So he undergoes this tikkun, this mending, and the rabbis say he's going to bring peace, he's going to resolve disputes. But in some ways, you know, I know you're interested in this idea of paradox, too, in a more general way. And Elijah is such, a, such an embodiment of paradox. I said he's an embodiment of Ruach HaKodesh, of the Holy Spirit, but he's also an embodiment of paradox. Is he human or is he an angel? Right? He really turns into an angel. Is he, is he human? Is he immortal? Is he what, coming into the Seder? Because I know we have to touch on the Seder. You know, in the Bible, Elijah is the ultimate loner. He says, in fact, three times he uses the word livadi. He says, I'm all alone. I'm all alone, everyone's out to get me. He has something of a persecution complex. It's not invented because Jezebel and others are out to get him, but he really, he really feels totally isolated. We, we hear nothing about a family, and yet what do we do? We invite him in to our most intimate family moments. You can't have a Seder without Eliyahu. I think every Jew has some relationship with Eliyahu because of of those childhood memories, because of Havdalah, because at, at a Brit Milah, a circumcision, there's a chair for Eliyahu. At the Seder table, there's a So, a so let's talk Eliyahu. about the, the Seder specifically, because that's what people came for. Right. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> first of all, something I've never shared with this, what, what's my name? Not Rabbi, but Elliot. I was born on or thereabouts around Passover because I was named Eliyahu first, Ah. and my British parents needed a good English name, so thus came Elliot. But your Hebrew Hebrew name is Eliyahu? Yeah, my Hebrew name's Eliyahu. I didn't even know. So, uh, yeah, um, (laughs) I'm kidding. That's amazing. Um, So, I just appear where, but when I was a kid, because I grew up in Los Angeles, um, I, I have a lot of fond memories of Passover, but... Uh, one of them was when we would get up uh, and sing Eliyahu Hanavi, um, I'd go around to the screen door and be like, it's me, I'm here. <laughs> um, and thus my rabbinic identity was born. But what, um, why are we inviting this bloke to our Seder table, right? What, it, it, it's, because yeah. uh, it, it's a mismatch. The, the Passover story is about slavery to freedom. The Passover story takes place in the book of Exodus long before the book of Kings, right? I I can imagine inviting other figures more uh, connected to the story. So why uh, do we invite Elijah specifically? And then it's curious because on the one hand, we all have this kumbaya moment of singing one of the most famous songs of Eliyahu Anavi, on the other hand, the verses that we utter, "Shvo uh, chamatcha al hagoyim," you know, pour out your wrath upon you know the nations. Are are it's nasty stuff. Right. So it's very confusing, Professor. Yeah, it somehow, somehow recalls the the fierce quality of Elijah. It's amazing. Your name is Eliyahu. I didn't I didn't know that. And you know, it's it's unusual to find a, a Jew named Eliyahu. It's, you know, it's not a common Jewish name. I think because it's so laden, it's so heavy, you know, a parent doesn't want to put that burden 
on a child necessarily, but with you, it if we if we weren't on camera, I'll tell you other burdens my parents uh, put on me. But uh, that's remarkable. So the seder, why why is Eliyahu connected with the seder? I think the simplest reason is that Yitziat Mitzrayim, the Exodus, is the time of redemption, the original redemption, and it's a time we look forward to the final redemption. So the rabbis actually say the Mashiach will appear on Pesach. Pesach is the time of redemption, both past and future. And if Eliyahu is supposed to announce the Mashiach, we hope that he, that he shows up to do that, uh, you know, this, this year. So that, that's the simplest reason. But what specifically with the door and the, the cup, opening the door for Elijah? Why do we open the door? Originally, opening the door had nothing to do with Elijah. The reason people opened their door the night of Passover was because it's a night of protection. Right? In Exodus, it's already called Leil Shimurim, a night of vigil, a night of watch, a night of protection. So the custom arose, we're so protected on this night, we don't have to lock the door. Some people would leave their door unlocked, some people would actually leave it open. And then also, remember what we say at the beginning of the Seder, Kol dichfin yechul, let all who are hungry come and eat. So some people opened the door for that reason. They said, we're opening the door if somebody's passing by and they need to come in, the door is open. But gradually this becomes associated with Eliyahu, actually pretty recently, by recently I mean like uh, a thousand years ago. It's not in the Bible, it's not in the Talmud, it's not in the Midrash. Here's something from the 11th century. Somebody says, this is Nisim Gaon, very well-known authority in the Middle Ages. I saw that my father would not close the doors of our house at all. And until now, this is our custom. And on the night of Pesach, the doors of the house are open. When Eliyahu comes, we will go out to greet him quickly, without any delay. Interesting, it's not so Eliyahu can come in, it's so we can go out. We hope he's going to come. If we see him coming, we want to rush out right away. So that, that custom is, you know, becomes part of, of Pesach. But as I say, originally not Eliyahu. And what about the cup? Why a cup for Eliyahu? Well, here's someone writing in the 15th century. This is even more recent. I've seen some people on the night of Pesach who pour a special cup and place it on the table, saying, this is the cup for Eliyahu Hanavi, and I don't know the reason. Okay, already then it's a custom, but this is a rabbi. He doesn't know the reason. Right? That's what rabbis do. They come up with reasons for things that already exist. So that's what he's trying to do, but it seems the reason derives from this. If Elijah the prophet comes on the night of Pesach, as we hope and expect, he too will need a cup. For even a poor person among Israel must drink no less than four cups, and if the cup isn't ready, we'd have to prepare it for him, which might delay the Seder. What's the worst thing could possibly happen? to delay the Seder. It's already so long, you're gonna look for a cup. Has it been made kosher le Pesach? Is Eliyahu gonna drink from it? You have a cup ready for Eliyahu. And it gradually, gradually enters first Ashkenazic custom and then Sephardic custom, but the best explanation of it, I think, one of the best is from the Gaon of Vilna, the greatest Talmudic authority of the, of the 18th, 19th centuries. He says, we have the custom of pouring a fifth cup and calling it the cup of Elijah. Okay, everybody drinks four cups. There's a fifth cup that's cup of Elijah. The reason is there's a dispute in the Gemara about whether you need a fifth cup, right? The tradition is we have four cups, but in the Talmud it says one opinion is five cups, and the halacha is not determined. Okay, the word teku isn't used there, but it's one of those things, it's not determined. When Elijah comes, the doubt will be clarified. This is one of the many doubts that he'll clarify. Therefore, based on this doubt, the cup is poured but not drunk, and it's called the cup of Elijah. For when he comes, all doubts will be clarified, including this doubt. So it's not really a cup for Elijah, it's a cup that he'll help us decide whether we should drink or not. That's why it's the cup of Elijah. And, and a beautiful custom, I don't remember to which rabbi this is attributed to, uh, that we do in our seders, mm. and I encourage you to do at your seders, is... Um, we don't fill the cup at the beginning, but at that moment of welcoming Elijah, every participant mm. pours a little bit from their own cup into the cup of Elijah, and we talk about 
a resolution, something that we want to do, not just by way of prayer alone do we welcome Elijah and redemption, but each of us, to use your language, yeah. Professor, can be Elijah-like in, yeah. you know, in, in bringing about redemption in our own time. I don't, I, I'm trying to remember which yeah, rabbi. That's what, yeah. yeah, it's a Sephardic rabbi who, who's surprised by this, and he says, you know, I learned from Ashkenazim, and I adopt this custom too. He says actually that he, he liked filling the cup, and he drank himself from that cup during the meal. But it's much more beautiful to what you said. In a way, it's saying you know each of us contributes to Elijah. We become Elijah, or we, you know, we contribute to that Elijah energy, because Elijah, in a sense, is really, you know, the the glue that keeps the Jewish people together, generation by generation. He really embodies again. He embodies, he embodies that that he's the link. He's the link from generation to generation. So he shows up at every Brit Milah. I don't know if we have time to discuss briefly Brit Milah and Havdalah. Yeah, let, let, let's touch on those just quickly, and then right. maybe we'll open it up for questions. But right. uh, he appears explicitly at a bris, right. at the conclusion of Shabbat with Havdalah, the differentiation service, service, and there's also a couple quieter moments that he appears. But let's do the, the two yeah. major ritual ones of Havdalah right. and Brit Milah. So Brit Milah, why does Elijah show up at a, at a ritual circumcision? A chair is actually designated, Kisei Eliyahu. There are many, many beautiful artistic uh, chairs through the, through the Middle Ages built for him. Um, the reason really goes back to, to a midrash, a late midrash. It was probably a custom much earlier. It was probably originally a custom for protection. Elijah is this angel-like figure, and either the infant or the mother could be in danger, and he wants to invoke some spirit to be there to, to protect the baby and, and her mother, his mother. So that's probably the origin, but, but the Midrash says that there's a great moment we have to skip over because we're covering, uh, we don't have the time, but after Elijah's defeat of the prophets of Baal, he then wanders into the desert to get away from Jezebel, and he finds himself walking to where? To Mount Sinai. It takes him 40 days and 40 nights to get to Mount Sinai, which reminds us of Moses being on Mount Sinai for 40 days. And at Mount Sinai, God reveals himself to Eliyahu in a very powerful way and then in a very gentle, silent way. And uh, God says, what are you doing here? Malachafo Eliyahu. What are you doing here? You should be with the people. You should be with the people. Elijah says, Kano Kineti. I've been zealously zealous. He really defines himself. He says, I am the zealot. Kano Kineti. It's the only time in the whole Bible that verb is repeated in two consecutive words. Kano Kineti. He says, Ki Azvu Britcha. Your people, Israel, have abandoned the covenant. So according to this Midrash, God said, you think they've abandoned the covenant? You show up at every covenant. You show up at every brit, right? Brit, bris, means a covenant of circumcision. God says, you have to show up at every brit, at every ritual circumcision, to see, to witness that the people of Israel have not abandoned your covenant. So that, that's the proof text that goes along with that custom of, of a chair for Elijah. Havdalah is, is very interesting. Why should Eliyahu appear at Abdullah? You could say, again, it's because of redemption. Shabbat is called me'en olam haba, right? A, a something similar to the world to come. It's a taste of the Messiah. Every Shabbat is a taste of messianic reality. Messiah will be full-time Shabbat, 24-7. Right? It's called yom shekulo Shabbat, a time that's entirely Shabbat is the Mashiach. So it makes sense on Shabbat to, have a, to hope for the Mashiach to come at the conclusion of Shabbat, if the Mashiach comes, he has to be announced by Eliyahu. Perhaps that's the reason, but it's more interesting than that. The Talmud actually asks, when will Eliyahu come? Okay, he'll come for the Mashiach, but when? What day of the week will he come? The Talmud says, well, we don't know what day of the week he's going to come, but we know he can't come on Friday. Why? Because people are too busy getting ready for Shabbat. So this is a joke. <laughs> this is a Talmudic joke. You, if people are too busy getting ready for Shabbat, you're not going to stop your Shabbos preparations just to go out to meet Eliyahu, are you? If you do, it's going to ruin the preparation for Shabbat. So the Talmud says he won't come on Friday. Okay, he won't come on Friday. Maybe he could come on Shabbat. Wouldn't that be beautiful? 
What's the problem? Can't travel. You can't travel. You can't travel. You can only travel 2,000 cubits, right? It's a half a mile. It's a lot more than half a mile from heaven to Yerushalayim. So we don't know if Eliyahu can travel on Shabbat, but wait a minute. Maybe that restriction about traveling on Shabbat doesn't apply if you're flying. The Talmud actually discusses this. If you're flying, maybe you can travel further. So the Talmud doesn't decide it. Again, it's one of those undetermined things. So we don't know if Eliyahu can come on Shabbat. He can't come on Friday. Okay, it's Saturday night. Shabbat is done. No more excuses. You have to show up, Eliyahu. So that's why we invite Eliyahu as we conclude Shabbat. And to tie all of these together, and then we'll open it up so next question comes from the community, uh, is there a thread that ties, and, and the, I think the chapter is Rituals of Anticipation in your book, mm -hmm. right? We have Havdalah going from Shabbat to the work week. We have Passover going from slavery to freedom. Mm -hmm. We have a child entering the covenant, and then... And then there are also two, mo you know, the very end of Yom Kippur, as you mm -hmm. men mentioned, it's not explicit. We don't sing Eliyahu Hanavi, but that last line of, uh, of Adonai Hu Elohim, that is the last line of the Yom Kippur mm -hmm. service. So is there a thread that uh, brings these all together, or, is it, or am, I, am I digging too deep? You're, you're, you're digging not deep enough. No, you're, dig you're digging beautifully. He, he, is, he is the figure of the in-between. One scholar has called him the virtuoso of the in-between. That's really Eliyahu. He's between heaven and earth. He's between human and divine. He's between past and present and future. He links the generation. So the moment of transition, right, liminal, that word that people love to use now, he's the, he's the liminal figure, literally the threshold. Right, so on the Seder, he was expected on the threshold, but he's linking us with our ancestors, with our children. He's linking the traditions too. You know, this is such a time of, of fanaticism and, and rivalry and, and hatred. And Eliyahu, I think, could be a bridge between Jews and Muslims, between Jews and Christians and Muslims. The Muslims have an Eliyahu figure. That they call him Al Khidr, the, the green one. But what, what exactly what is said about Eliyahu is said about al Khidr. And he inspires the Sufis, just as Eliyahu inspires the, the Jewish mystics. In fact, Jews in Muslim countries sometimes call Eliyahu al Khidr because mm. they grew up with that tradition in their environment. So I think he presents a possibility of, of uh, reconciling that, uh, th those, those painful divisions. Thank you. I have so many more questions, but let's open it up for anyone who has a question. Mara has a microphone, and uh, please, please, yes, sir. Um, and and I, I don't know what you're going to say, but short statement with a question mark after. That's what I'm <laughs> putting it together. Uh, Elijah comes at the end of the Haggadah, and as a guest, one would think a guest would come at the beginning of a party. So why? was decided to have Elijah come at the end rather than earlier to join in, celebrate, you know, leave early. Yeah, originally, uh, why does he come so late? Originally, the door was opened early at the beginning of the Seder, either to invite in those who need or perhaps for Eliyahu himself. And then it's moved toward the end to be near that paragraph that the rabbi mentioned, Shvochamatcha, pour out your wrath. It's not necessarily that Eliyahu, you know, is doing that, but it makes sense, given his fierce biblical quality, that he would be linked with, with that prayer. So it, it makes a certain kind of sense that he would be invoked then. But, you know, you have the cup there, either empty or full, right at the beginning, so children are wondering about it, and he's somehow, he's somehow there. You know, his name, his name never appears in the Haggadah, right? It never says this is the time for Eliyahu to come. People, people will sing that song, but Eliyahu and Aviv's song is not in the Haggadah itself, as far as I recall. Right, Moshe isn't mentioned in the Haggadah, Eliyahu isn't mentioned in the Haggadah, but Eliyahu's presence, I think, I think is there from the beginning just because of the cup, even though the door has been moved to, to a later part. Who, who would, there, there's a 
custom of having Miriam's cup. Mm. And I'm wondering if you, I'm worried about Elijah being too gendered. Mm. And I'm wondering if, if you were the king of the Jews, right? I mean, what would be the analog in Jewish feminist literature that you would invite mm -hmm. uh, mm. into these liminal moments? I mean, M Miriam is, mm -hmm. many people have a Miriam's cup, but I'm wondering what right. you think, Professor. Yeah, D Daniel, Daniel is No, fine. but it's more now fun that, calling now, you now Professor. Now that we're in the last closing minutes. Um, yeah, no, no I, I wouldn't want to supplant Miriam. I think Miriam, certainly, she's more central to the Exodus story than, than Eliyahu, so it makes perfect sense. It's interesting, you know, the Zohar actually says, the Zohar implies that Eliyahu was too, he was too much filled with testosterone. The Zohar actually, it doesn't use that term, but the Zohar says he was too much male energy. That was his zealotry. That was his violence. So there's a need to balance the masculine with the feminine. You know, this is an opportunity for me to just say that this is probably the greatest contribution of the Kabbalah to insist that God is equally male and female, ultimately beyond all gender, right? Ultimately, in Sof, God as infinity is neither male nor female, but there's such an emphasis on the patriarchal, on the masculine, God as king, as judge, as warrior. So I think Kabbalah's greatest contribution was Shekhinah. In the Zohar, Eliyahu falls in love with the Shekhinah. And uh, I think the Shekhinah kisses Eliyahu, according to one, one passage in the Zohar. So maybe the Zohar is trying to, to mellow him, trying to bring in some feminine, compassionate energy. And eventually Eliyahu, I think, does change from being this, you know, this fierce masculine hero into, into more a balanced figure. Right. My vote would be uh, Serach Bat Asher, oh. because there's this figure who appears in Genesis and then is referred to later, lives throughout the, the descent down to Egypt, throughout the bondage in Egypt, and into the entrance into the Promised Land. And maybe, you know, the Jewish Lives series will have a follow-up <laughs> to a book on Elijah <coughs> There can be a book on this mystical, never-ending, midrashic Jewish woman Good. named Sarah Bat Asher, the daughter of Asher. Is there another question? Yes, in the back. Might you describe one of the times when Elijah's discussed that it's more uh, ephemeral, like those, those minor moments and what, they're, what one is like? You said there was two major ones, right? A, a bris and the Haggadah. Like, oh, what's where, another one? Where maybe? else? Where else yeah, in where Jewish else ritual yeah. does Eliyahu appear? He seems to pop up almost everywhere. You know, anyone who's fully observant actually says three times a day, "May God send us Eliyahu." Right? Is in Birkat Hamazon, Harachamanu Yishlach Lanu et Eliyahu Hanavi, Zachur Latov. May the compassionate one, right? That somehow fits with who Eliyahu becomes. That's a common rabbinic name for God, Harachaman. May the compassionate one send us Eliyahu Hanavi. May he be, may he be remembered gratefully. Vivasar lanu besorotovot. And may he bring us good tidings. Meaning, you know, may he, may he bring the Mashiach along with him. So that's, you know, three times a day. Uh, there's actually, Eliyahu is also invoked in the Vidui. The Vidui is the traditional prayer you recite as you're about to pass away. And Eliyahu is named there in so certain versions of the Vidui. Somehow maybe, you know, again, the transition, again, that, that liminal moment, the ultimate liminal moment from life to death. And Eliyahu apparently went through that moment and emerged. So he fits in there too. There, there are several others, but that, that's what comes yeah, my, to mind. My, my, my personal favorite uh, is not made explicit, but the moment of Elijah seeking refuge in the cave and... There's this mm. passage where God was not in the thunder, yes. God was not in the lightning or the earthquake, but God was in what's uh, referred to as a kol mama daka, the still small voice. And on Yom Ki on the high holidays, there's a famous prayer, the unetane tokef, mm. when we pass by God in uh, like sheep uh, of God's flock. And, uh, and actually, if you got a good cantor, and we got the best here at Park Avenue Synagogue, 
um, the, the sound of the cantor's voice is the still sm uh, small voice mm -hmm. at that moment, um, right? A, uh, yeah. a, a ripple a, a yes. of, of, that, of that biblical moment. So, such a beautiful verse, such a beautiful verse. It's chapter 19 of Kings, I think it's 1912. Just look it up, right? When, when God appears to Elijah at Mount Sinai, it says Mount Horeb, Mount Horeb, that's Mount Sinai. And it's, maybe it's a critique of Elijah, right? It says God was, there was a, a wind, a powerful wind, lo baruach Adonai. God was not in the ruach, in that ruach. And then a fire, lo vaesh Adonai. And then, then an earthquake, right? Lo varash Adonai. Then a fire, lo vaesh Adonai. And then comes this kol de mama daka. It's such a beautiful phrase. It's often translated because of the King James Version, and it's a beautiful phrase itself in English, a still, small voice. But the Hebrew doesn't really mean that exactly. It's kol de mama daka. Those of you who know Hebrew, it's, it's a smichut. It's a construct. It's really kol can mean sound or voice. So I translate it, a sound of sheer stillness. It may be a sound of sheer silence or a sound of sheer stillness. It's called a sound of Dimamadaka, thin stillness. Dimama is really the sound after a storm. The sound when the storm ends is Dimama. So that is where God is found. Maybe this is a critique of Elijah. Don't go ranting and raving. Don't you know, vent all of your rage. God is found in, in gentleness, in stillness. It's really a, a hint at meditation. Any, any chance Bible. that's where Simon and Garfunkel got it? That may be. That may be where they got the phrase. Now, wouldn't that be amazing, like a Leonard Cohen story, but a Simon and Garfunkel story? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Simon went, to, he went to day school. Yeah, so, uh, okay. So I'm not crazy. Let's find that out. Uh, well, I might be crazy. All right. Uh, I think we have time for maybe a couple more. Yes, sir. Um, well, thanks for this moment. Uh, what is the influence between Elijah and Jesus Christ? Because we have many things in common. We have his, the, the miracle of feeding, the miracle of making uh, somebody that is dead to life, his, I don't know, resurrection or the way, the way he appears again on earth. Uh, the way he helps people from time to time, uh, how do they relate one to the other? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. We, I don't have time to answer it in adequately, but let me say a few things quickly. First of all, I said that Elijah is important in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. We've talked a lot about Yiddishkeit, a little bit about Islam. In the New Testament, Eliyahu appears. Why? Because he's supposed to announce the Mashiach. Right? Now, it, I said that we, sp we spoke about this verse in Malachi, in Malachi, right? I'm sending to you Elijah the prophet. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, it's easy to lose that verse because it's, you know, the end of the prophets. It's about the middle, of the, a little past the middle of the Hebrew Bible. But in a Christian Old Testament, right, the Christian Old Testament has all the books in the Hebrew Bible, but in a different order. What's the last book in the Christian Old Testament? It's Malachi. It's Malachi. So the very last page, the very last few lines of the Old Testament in the Christian Bible has, I'm sending to you Elijah the prophet before the day of the Lord. What happens if you turn the page? The Gospel of Matthew. The very next page after Elijah's predicted appearance is the Gospel. So Elijah, it makes sense that he would be in part of that story. And in fact, Jesus is asked, about who, who is the person who, who announces Jesus in the New Testament? John the Baptist. Jesus says in the New Testament that John the Baptist is Elijah. Jesus himself identifies John the Baptist as Elijah. It doesn't mean that he's Elijah reincarnated. He's Elijah. It just changes his name. Why is that? Because if Jesus is the Messiah, Elijah has to announce the Messiah but wait a minute, John the Baptist announces the Messiah. Well, John the Baptist is Elijah. But it's more interesting than that. Why did Jesus think of himself as the Messiah? We don't know if he did or when he did. But if he did, he didn't think of himself as the Messiah at the beginning of his career. He thought of himself as a prophet. And it's very likely he thought of himself as Elijah. 
he actually gives a sermon in his hometown shul in Nazareth, and he says, he says, you know, he has a beautiful line, one of the greatest lines in the New Testament, a prophet is never accepted in his own hometown. He's talking about himself because he aroused a lot of opposition. And then he talks about Elijah and Elisha, how they weren't accepted. So it seems that Jesus identified with Elijah and he may have thought of himself as Elijah. And then later when he's seen as the Messiah, either by himself or by Christian believers, he can no longer be Elijah. John the Baptist has to be Elijah. So he's very important there. But I will say one other thing about, there's something amazing about Elijah. We talked about his, his Ruach and how he embodies the Ruach. In a sense, I want to be careful how I say this, but in a sense, Elijah resembles Jesus. And to, to make that point, I just want to read something that a, a Kabbalist wrote. It's actually what I put at the very beginning of the book. I found it right before the book was completed. This is from Moses Cordovero, one of the greatest Kabbalists, lived in Sfat and Safed, 16th century. L listen, here what he says about Elijah. His mystery is really the mystery of divinity spreading. Divine energy clothes itself in him, extending to the world. Elijah never appears in the world without the mystery of divinity revealing itself through him. The mystery of God on earth is the mystery of Elijah. The closest that divinity can possibly come to humanity is the mystery of Elijah. It's a remarkable, shocking statement, but I think it uh, responds to, a, to what you were asking. I'm going to ask uh, you the final question, Daniel. So, uh, is there, in writing this book, uh, I'm going to give you the option, dealer's choice here. Uh, either uh, your favorite Elijah story, or that you press print on this book and you say, oh, I can't believe I forgot that Elijah story. Uh, or maybe it's both. Is there something that since a publication you've discovered that you wish if, that was in this book, or is there a story that yeah, yeah. just uh, you carry with you uh, that you could share with us? Yeah, yeah. No, I've, I've discovered things ever since finishing the book. The, the back of back pages are just scribbles of things that, that people wrote me about or that, that I discovered. But I, I think I'll close just with this very, very short, short story. Actually, I, I'll do two, two. They're each like you know a paragraph. I'm going to tell two. To Elijah stories because they're both about the, the Seder. Once before Passover, according to a Hasidic tale, the disciples of Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, okay, the Kotska Rebbe, complained to him about this. About what? About the fact that Elijah never seems to show up. So the Kotska Rebbe promised them that Elijah would be revealed to them at the upcoming Seder. On the first night of the festival, the room was full. The atmosphere charged with Elijah's cup waiting on the table. The Seder proceeded, and finally the door was opened. What happened next left the disciples astonished. Nothing. No one appeared. Crushed, they turned to their Rebbe, whose face was beaming. Seeing their distress, he asked, what's troubling you? They told him. Fools, he thundered. Do you think Elijah the prophet enters through the door? He enters through the heart. And I'll close with, with this one, which is uh, near the end of the book. According to a Hasidic tale, a pious Jew once asked his Rebbe why Eliyahu never appeared on the night of the Seder. Even though the door was open for him and his goblet of wine was waiting on the table, the Rebbe told him, there's a very poor family in your neighborhood. Go visit them and propose that next year you and your family will celebrate Pesach with them in their house and you'll provide everything they need for the whole holiday. Then on the night of the Seder, Eliyahu will certainly come. The man did as he was told. But after the following Pesach, he returned to the Rebbe, complaining that once again Eliyahu had failed to appear. The rabbi responded, Eliyahu came, but you couldn't see him. Holding a mirror to the man's face, he continued, Look, 
This was Elijah's face that night. That's beautiful. Bim he rabbi amenu. May Elijah come and may we all participate in the act of bringing Elijah into our time. Todaraba to Daniel Matt. Thank you so much. Thank you.